And welcome back to the table, everyone. Today we're going to play some fighting formations. And we're going to do a scenario out of the Kharkov expansion that they have for fighting formations. Uh, specifically, let me grab it here for you. We'll be doing scenario 19, uh, a change of orders. This is in the Ukraine, 7 January 1944. So the Soviet Second Ukrainian Front launched a major offensive in late December of 1943 in southern Russia. The attacks began in Ernst, 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 on 5 January 1944, with the goal of breaking through the German lines of the Kir Kirovograd area. I don't speak Russian. These caused multiple gaps in the German lines. On the evening of January 7th, Gross Deutschland units were close at hand and were called upon to help remedy the tenuous situation. The next day, units of 1st Battalion Gross Deutschland Regiment fought its way into Muchartovka, blocking a serious threat to the German right flank. Their assault guns were key to this push, temporarily stabilizing the line in this village. Yet due to even more intense Soviet pressure to the north, the Stug 3s were requested as assistance right in the middle of the ongoing fight. At this very moment, the Soviets were initiating another attack at Merchartkova. Despite Gross Deutschland's tenuous hold, here the Stugs were ordered out and sent north to Aninska. The remaining Panzer Grenadiers now faced a very desperate situation indeed. So the aftermath, so historically, the Panzer Grenadiers had barely enough time to consolidate their defenses before the Soviets began another attack. It was a powerful drive, and the Stug 3s had been a key factor in their defense. However, they were ordered north. The men left behind managed to hold on, but it was a very, very intense fight. Temperatures hovered near negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Yikes, which didn't help. No, that's cold. Which in Celsius is like minus 300 or something like that. The Soviets came on without let-up. But the threat here was eventually stopped and the Germans in Merchartovka were finally reinforced with tanks and assault guns. Gross Deutschland Division, even though thrown into the lines piecemeal, had pinched off many of the Soviet attacks. The early January attempt, uh, attempted Soviet breakthrough failed after 12 days of very bitter fighting throughout the Kirovograd area. The extraordinary flexibility of Gross Deutschland's defensive tactics went out, if only temporarily. Okay, so sorry for mispronouncing the German or the uh, Russian names, and sorry for mispronouncing the German words as well. Unfortunately, I only speak one language, and um, the other ones not so fluently. Okay, so we have it set up here. Now I am because I'm playing this solo. I'm making a lot of changes, if you will. Um, now, when I say that, I don't mean that in a way to justify mistakes that I make. I'm, I'm going to explain the changes I'm making to the game, and then that way you can call out things that I definitely did get wrong. So, first thing, with this scenario particularly, particularly, I did get, for the German player, uh, 13, I think it was 13 sighting markers. There was 4 false, 5 hidden, 2 minus 2 wire. I first thought about putting hidden units and stuff but when you play solo it's like does it really matter so much you know if you got things hidden I think I bumped my table a little bit here um, so I figured what I would do yeah I think I bumped my table just put some of these back how I thought what I would do with the hidden markers I've, I really did think about this at first instead of worrying about hidden units I thought about and I think I'll do this here I'm gonna go ahead and put some of these sighting markers down. Not all of them. The ones I'm putting down are the false sightings, and then there's a couple with barbed wire, and there's a couple with, um, I think I had some barbed wire and a couple mines. So what I'm going to do is put them kind of here in front where we've got some units. Uh, mostly, yeah, something like this. I'm just going to put some of those. That way, as I have units come up, if they get something adjacent, they can reveal and see what it is. And I was hoping that the German player was going to be on the defensive so they don't have to move forward and run over their own stuff because apparently they can be affected by running over their own stuff. So uh, as far as setting up, German player, I think, sets up first. Now, there are 
on this map a bunch of spots that are already marked as control hexes for the German player. So I put the control markers there for the German player. And then I just lined up some units here to just kind of play a defensive game. Now, in regular fighting formations, those scenarios are usually really big and involve a lot of units. Kharkov has smaller scenarios and a lot fewer units. So I did get four Grenadier platoons, but then one MG-34 platoon and one MG-42 squad. So it's not even a platoon, because usually if a platoon takes damage, it breaks down it like breaks apart and all the squads fall out of it. Um, and then you have, I didn't place the entrenchment markers. I get two, three of those. Uh, yeah, I was debating on that. I might just leave those out for now. Well, let's do it. I'm going to put them in here with some grenadiers. They're inside. They're entrenched in their buildings. It might not do any good for them, but we'll see here. Uh, I'll just put a couple here. Here, you guys are entrenched. Uh, but then, like, the oncoming Russians have six rifle, one SMG, one engineer platoon, so platoons, one maximum MG platoon, which I, yeah. Well, they actually are coming with a lot of stuff. They actually got platoons. Oh, let me put all these back. Yeah, I must have bumped my table. All of these are all shifted around wonky. Not how I intended them. And, uh, but then individually, well, one platoon, but here, individual SU-85, one, or two individual SU-85s, one individual T-70. So a lot of times, all of this would be platoons, and a lot more. So anybody who's played regular fighting formations knows that these scenarios are usually pretty big. Now, this still might take a little while to play out. We won't get that all done in one, one go today. So I'll spread this out over a few days and just see kind of where where it goes. Uh, if I move this... Alright, let's look here at the setup. So this is set... Just tightening up something here real quick. Okay, that should help out. We're going to be starting on turn 6. And then we're going to go to turn 11. And then from that point on is checking for sudden death. Now, the game does that. It's kind of cool because instead of saying... Like basically, it's saying that normally this would be like one, two, three, four, five, six turns to play. But the way the sudden death mechanic works is when you start checking for sudden death, you got to roll two die ten. And then if it's under the sudden death number, that's the last turn. Like the game's done, right? Uh, so by starting it at, t if you wanted to have, you know, a game that was just five turns long, it'd be really hard to roll. Here knows that things are coming but doesn't know where exactly. So they're going to pass. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Now we started at five, I spent seven, so that puts the initiative track on the two side for the Russian player. Okay, um, so we passed. We spent the initiative, if you will, uh, ordering the snipers and making sure they're in place, but then we passed. So we're now two points on to the Russian side, so they're going to roll to see how much initiative they spend, or have to spend. They get four. So looking at the tracker for them, they can do rally. Rally activated units. But they don't need to rally anything, so it's not wasted for them. But they can look, you can spend your order down. So for example, I can do rally, but if I spend that for initiative, I could actually spend it on a fire or a move. I still spend four initiative points, so let me do that real quick. One, two, three, four. And Russians can move with a two. So they can move. So we're going to move some units up. Now, moving units, basically what you're going to do is decide what units you want to move. And then, um, if they are out of command, it costs an additional two initiative points. There's a special rule that this radioless unit, this T-70, uh, for this scenario, it's considered to have a radio. So it does not incur the additional communication or initiative points to spend in order to act. Yeah, you probably can't see that very well. I know the, this camera is zoomed out so you can see the whole thing, so I know you won't be able to see a lot of the counters very well, so I apologize for that. We could probably just zoom in a little bit now and then, 
So, you know, be prepared for the camera to move around a lot. Okay. So he's got the R, normally that's radioless, but he does have a radio. So I'm going to start pushing this side. So what you can do is you have this particular scenario. We have three command tokens that we can spend. Now, when you put this down, this represents leadership in an abstract way. It could be generals in jeeps. Um, it could be dudes on the horses riding around, giving order, whatever, whatever. So it's just an abstract command focus. And this is where that range of two comes in. So the Soviet well, Russians, now, okay, let me just throw this out there. Y'all can clarify for me. I saw this as a debate on Facebook where if you say Soviets, that represents like the regime, but it doesn't necessarily represent the people fighting. Kind of like when you say you're not, you know, you're not fighting Nazis, but it's the German army. So you don't say Soviets because that's the party, but you say that they're the Russian people because Russian people came from all backgrounds during World War II when they fought. So when you say Soviets, not all the Russians who fought were Soviets because that was the political party. And so I've opted to use the term Russians this game. I'm going to try and use that. But tell me if that's wrong because I get a lot of my knowledge from Facebook. And as we know, Facebook isn't always the best place to get your history and how you should refer to things. So I don't mean to turn this into any kind of political debate, but at the same time, if I'm playing a game, I want to, you know, based on historical events, I would like to somewhat accurately represent how I should call the units involved. So I'm using Germans and Russians. So if that's wrong, please let me know what would be better uh, going forward. All right, so with that in mind, the Russian player can put down his command and they have a range of two. That's what we saw earlier. So out to two hexes. And this is almost called the mission command sites. So when you first put the token down, it's on a zero. This represents the additional initiative cost to activate these units. When a turn is over and a turn is completed when all 10 unit uh, activation cubes have been used, you flip this to the tactical side and then it still has a range of two. And when you activate these units, they do have an additional one initiative. So as the battle continues, your troops get tired, they need to rest, uh, command goes to sleep. So the cost of things gradually gets better. And then that's why I say over time, these recycle through the system and then you can put them back on the board on the zero side, which for me just kind of represents at some point over a multi-day battle, people went to sleep and then they woke up and they weren't so tired. Um, so just, I think, very interesting narrative and simple mechanics to represent very complex things in your game that maybe sometimes are overlooked. So this has your logistics, this has your supply built in. It's pretty cool. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to pop this here, he here, because that will give me a range of two. I can activate this T70. I can activate this machine gun unit. Flip around so I can read it. And this is what's cool. The back side is not your wounded side. The back side shows that a unit is active. What a great, great tool, great, what a great tool to help you remember who's ready to do something. You just flip it. And then right here, this square tells you how many movement points it gets. Simple. Um, and then also you'll notice, maybe not zoomed out here, but your combat values change too. So when a unit is active to fight, it generally has higher combat values like shooting and whatnot than if it's just sitting stationary. So when it's active to do things, its combat values kind of change too. So I, I think that's kind of cool mechanic. It's not just normally you flip it and that's the wounded side here. This has additional stuff baked into the number so you don't have all these charts, you know, like, okay, well, if he's activated, he gets plus one to this, he's plus three to that because he's the active player. Yeah, it's just kind of baked into the numbers. It's kind of cool. All right, um, so now what do we do? Well, as I move forward, I want to make sure I take this mission command with me because uh, it can just stay put, but you can pick it up and move it with you. It's not really representing people or attachments or anything like that. It's just a little thing that you can pick up, 
you know, you have to pick it up with a unit though and then drop it off along the way if you want. So first he's activated, so we'll move him. He can move up to 14 and this is all open terrain. What we're gonna do is just go one, two. Now at this point, the German player has to make a decision. Does he have units that can opportunity fire? Now that we're at the slope of this next higher level of, of uh, terrain, we can see down, they can see up. Uh, so it's reciprocal line of sight. So if the German player can see you, the Russian player can see you. Now I have a few units that may. This uh, Stug here can only shoot out his front hexes, but he's got blocking line of sight. So that forest, MG42 isn't can't hurt that. It's got uh, big armor. This can't. This uh, SDK troop transport has maybe a high explosive gun, but nothing with armor piercing. We've got this gun here, but trees are in the way. Trees are in the way. So that's cool. T-70 moved down here. It's not a big heavy combat unit, more like a, a spotting duding on. So for instance, the default is one. If you roll a one on any of your attack dice, the shot automatically fails. It gets lost in the train because your flat map does not properly represent all the little dips and swirls and, and terrain that just happens to be in the real world. So if you roll a one, it automatically misses. But if I was shooting over rough terrain, rough terrain might be a two. So that means if I roll my attack and I rolled a two, then it gets lost somewhere in the rough terrain. But my attack roll was super stupendous and his defense roll was not as good. Now, because I smashed his defense, I've got some really cool damage tokens. I had them off to the side. So what you do is you draw in your bag. My eyes are closed. Not really. And I draw, all of these damage chits are double sided. I drew this one. Stunned, ooh. He can't fire, he can't move. So there's no mechanic necessarily in the game for stunned. What you look for are these circles. So can't fire, can't move. And then to heal this, I have to do a rally and roll 12 or higher to get rid of that. And if I roll under that number, I think you gotta roll that number or higher and you're fine, but if I was to say roll 11 or less, he would just stay stunned. Um, some of these have a red number, and if you fail your red number check, the unit is eliminated. So this one is just gonna sit here stunned. So what I'm gonna do is since they can't move or fire anymore, I'm gonna flip them from their non-active side to their inactive side. So he's done. Done. Okay, this DSHK machine gun is gonna move up to the woods because they want to start to support some infantry as we move. Not too much infantry. All my infantry is on the other side. I didn't set these up very well at all. I realize that now. Okay, so here we go. One, take the command with them. Two, three, four, and that's as far as you can move. He's only got five movement points, so we'll say he's done. And you brought the command. So you might ask yourself, well, what happens if your enemy runs over your command point? Well, then the command point is eliminated and it's no longer part of the game. So you want to move those up close enough so they can have an effect on battle. I guess you want to see what we're doing. But at the same time, um, you got to protect them a little bit because, yeah, you don't want to lose them. So we flipped them because he's done. They can move a little bit. So one, two, three, we're gonna move right here, four, five, engineer. Keep them safe in the woods. And then we got a T-34 who's gunning for that, well you can't see it, that's off the map, but we've got a Panzer we wanna shoot at. Now we're just moving, so we can't move and shoot. There actually is a move and shoot that you could do. Um, I think that's the assault. I guess I could have done an assault move, but no, because we roared, rolled a four for rally, so we couldn't do an assault. So the um, that would let you move and fire with units, but they're just moving. So one, two, three, and you get a free pivot there, four. So we're gonna go like that. So they're coming up to the slope because they wanna take shots at the Panzer. 
Now the Panzer could opportunity fire at this point as well. Because uh, where we're measuring, I got to remember since I'm kind of tried to zoom in on a couple times there. Uh, so that just goes right in the open. So we can go ahead and try to shoot there. And that's in the front arc of both of those. All right, so let, let's see what we can do to that T-34 platoon. Uh, oh, I did forget to, it costs initiative to activate that a unit. So that Stug, oh, let's see, the Stug, it's, I didn't put down, I, I you could put down these command markers whenever you want. Um, so what I should have done was placed one here, like, I could put it near the Stug, because we've got, Germans have a command radius of three, one, two, three, like, it covers quite a bit. So I could, like, put it back here, keep it safe, and then still activate stuff. So that would have been zero activation. If I don't put a command marker down for this Panzer, when it does its opportunity fire, that costs two initiative points. That gives that swings the initiative point two points towards the Russian player. So I don't know if I necessarily want to do that. Um, so I'm going to pop down some orders here. That way, when he opportunity fires now, it costs zero. Now, the only reason why that might be bad is because if I had, was planning some kind of assault to move forward, you know, I might want those command tokens to be used somewhere else on the line. To motivate troops to act and do stuff but again we have a range of three all okay I knew I jumped the gun just a little bit so let me re-clarify here so we're good on the squad if the squad is hit again while it has a marker on it then it's eliminated so it's just gonna sit there while it's got its its marker the platoon same thing it's gonna sit here with this marker on it and it won't do anything until we try to rally it or this is where the platoons come in. What I can do is I can, because right now this pin marker or this unconfirmed kill affects the whole platoon, I could voluntarily split the platoon into individual tanks and then this marker would sit on one tank and I'd be free to do actions with these other tanks. As it stands, this whole platoon now is now pinned down by anti-tank fire from the Panzer IV. So, if this gets hit again, then it will destroy a tank. Then I replace it with two tanks, and then one of these will carry down the offending marker that we draw for it. So, I was getting that one ahead of myself a little bit. I was killing tanks before they needed to die. So right now, this unit is effectively pinned down by accurate anti-tank fire from the Panzer IV. They can no longer move and they can't return fire. Also, the two dice I rolled did not trigger a spent for the Panzer IV II, so he's free to fire again if they were to move, but they can't. Now, at this point, we have act we have done carried out all the activations with the units we had designated for activation, and based on that, that had actually swung the initiative to the number two side for the German player. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to cut this video short here mostly because a lot of this video was talking about setting up uh, you know introducing you to this particular scenario and then we spent some time talking about rules clarified uh, a thing here and that's probably a good start so we are knee deep in turn one actually so yeah this is probably good i think by the time this is done this will be close to an hour i think that's a good a good start now next time i play this will probably be spread out over a few days We'll see how far we can get uh, before I, before my, um, what do you call that, my gamer attention deficit disorder kicks in. But I definitely want to put a few more videos of this up for you so you can, you can at least watch one entire turn over a couple of days play out. I think the game will speed up now that we've explained some of the basics of the rules and introduced the scenario. Um, so, you know, look, look forward to that. But I think today we spent... We spent, we spent pretty good time just getting you kind of a rules primer and set up for it. Uh, yeah, so we'll go from there. Anyway, thank you for tuning in. If you've played, you know, Fighting Formations, please share.